I feel like I don't remember a whole lot of my life from before I was eight years old. I feel like a lot of us have trouble remembering our early years, but when something big happens, it can make it easier to orient our memories in time. When I was eight, my dad was in a bad accident. He nearly died a number of times, and he was in a coma for weeks on end. I have some very distinct memories of that period. As my dad began to recover and return home, my favorite aunt was diagnosed with a terminal disease. She was 34. She would die two years later. There are a lot of feelings there for a little person to try and make sense of. The feeling that I think I remember the most is that feeling that as an adult, I have felt a number of times, the desperate wish that you could control what was happening, the clinging to hope and the uneasy fragility of everything around you. Welcome to Death Becomes Her, the mini cast where we spend five to ten minutes discussing death, dying, and grief from a variety of angles. I'm your host, Lyella Kelly. I wanted to take just a couple of minutes to discuss a part of death that can get real messy real fast interpersonal relationships at the end of life. End of life, especially the 11th hour, as it were, when death is imminent, can be fraught with little landmines just waiting to go off. And it is no surprise there is a lot at play, as you may well know. For example, relationships of different sorts are all coming together in one space. There are family relationships, romantic relationships, friendships, professional acquaintances like caregivers, hospice, and the medical team. They're all trying to find their appropriate spot in this small pressure cooker that is the end of life. It's no surprise then that the little irritations that normally would be dismissed quickly passing, leaving only a small prickle of irritation, suddenly become landmines. Before you know it, everyone in the room is tiptoeing around trying not to step on a hidden mine. Take a minute to imagine that scenario in a literal sense. Imagine a group of people in a small space, a living room or a hospital room. Each person has inadvertently, without intent, hidden a landmine, maybe even two or three. They didn't mean to plant the mines, and they're not even sure where they have put them. All we know is that they're there. Imagine the sense of fear and dread hanging in that room. One innocent, wrong step and one will go off. Likely there will be a rush of panic and in the confusion, another will be stepped on. And now in that tiny little space, there are injuries and a whole lot of fear. This whole situation could explode at any minute, leaving deep wounds and scars. Have you ever been in that room? Many of us have. End of life is hard work, hard work for everyone. Someone we care about is dying. We are desperate to give them everything they need to be comfortable and at peace. It can feel like a battle that plays out for us internally as we try to process the impending loss, the love, the anticipatory grief, the fear, the guilt, the anger, and whatever else might be bubbling up inside of us. To add a little more pressure, everywhere we turn, we're pushing up against people who are in the same precarious position as we are, fighting their own version of the same battle. Much like eight-year-old me, everyone in that room is stuck in a desperate situation that they can't control, and even though we're older, it's still hard to navigate. So let's talk strategy. What are a couple of things that we can do to successfully navigate the 11th hour with grace? First, humility. We can't read minds and hearts, so we can't possibly fully understand the motivation behind certain comments or actions. That being the case, we may not have a complete grasp of where someone else is coming from. We will be better off if we assume that the others are motivated by good rather than malicious intentions. 
Humility will also help us to remember that we don't know everything and that our way isn't necessarily the only way or the right way. Second strategy. When our feelings get hurt, and they likely will because end of life is an exceptionally difficult time that rubs us raw, leaves us feeling exposed, don't involve others in the conflict. This will inflame the situation. Pulling others into the fray will likely lead to taking sides and an us versus them vibe. If you need to vent, and you likely do, confide in a neutral third party, someone who will simply listen and be a shoulder for you to lean on. Finally, Don't lose sight of the big picture. Someone you love is dying. Your job is to support and love them. This isn't about you. There will be plenty of time later when you can focus more on you. So make sure you're not vying for the top position on the totem pole. Bump yourself down to second or third, maybe even fourth or fifth in line, and focus on who really matters in this moment. Unless you're the one in the bed, it's not you. Your role is simply to love and support. Make the most of that privilege. Make your loved one proud. It's hard, but if you get yourself in the right mindset, you'll contribute to a peaceful environment for you and your loved ones. Before I go, I wanted to share a service that I provide for individuals who are experiencing the strains and difficulties that frequently manifest at the end of life. Often, it can be useful to verbalize the concerns, the fears, the anger that you may not otherwise have an outlet for. If you need a private, safe space to share your thoughts, a support conversation may be just what you're looking for. A brief conversation may help you to rebalance and refocus, allowing you to be more emotionally present for those who need you. You can find more information on this at leavingwellmt.com. Thank you for listening to the Death Becomes Her minicast. Connect with me, Lyella Kelly, at www.leavingwellmt.com. Special thanks to Roman Belove for our intro and outro music. Thank you for tuning in. And remember, talking about death won't kill you. I promise.